Happy Monday, everybody. I hope you guys had a good day, good weekend. Um, so we have a guest speaker tonight. Um, tonight's guest speaker is Annalena Davis. Um, she's a web developer at Syracuse University um, and also a board member for Codes for Syracuse. She is also a part of Women in Coding. Um, she works primarily in PHP and JavaScript with a special focus on creating inclusive and accessible user interfaces. Um, her presentation is entitled Advice for Breaking into the Tech Industry from a Career Changer. So without further ado, uh, please give a big virtual Zoom round of applause for Annalena. Um, we're gonna have about a 25 minute presentation as usual, and then about five minutes for questions. Um, so Annalena, feel free um, to share your screen and take it away. Thank you, Caitlin. Um, let's see, I will share my screen then. <clears throat> and if anything comes up in the chat, I guess, feel, or feel free to interrupt or chat or whatever. Uh, but um, so uh, my name is Annalena Davis, like Caitlin said. Um, I, my background is pretty varied. Um, I worked in environmental education, uh, community development, and most recently before getting into web development, I was an artist <clears throat> and I sold um, most of my work online, um, some in-person stuff. And then in 2017, I was, I was working on my business website and I decided I wanted to start coding some more. I, I had coded a little bit, just very basic HTML years ago. Um, and then I saw that there was a class that summer and I decided to take it. Um, it was just it's much less intense than the one that you guys are taking. Uh, it was web design, HTML, CSS, and then just a little intro to JS. Um, but it got me started. And it, at first I thought I would kind of use that to supplement my, uh, my work as an artist and just kind of do a little bit of freelance web design or web development on the side and then work as an artist as well but I decided that I just loved coding so much that I wanted to make that my career instead. So I kind of, you know, just kept going, um, did a lot of learning on my own. Um, I used Team Treehouse and their full stack JavaScript track. Uh, I used, I took a class in, with Udacity, which was called the Mobile Web Specialist Nano Degree, but they also had a little focus on accessible web development, which helped me get into my current position. <clears throat> Uh, and then I did some freelance web development um, and along with working on personal projects for a, a little while before I got my position at Syracuse University. Um, and I, I work for the College of Visual Performance, Performing Arts right now. Uh, I actually have two more weeks and then I just got a new position at the Central University marketing team, um, digital team. So I'm pretty excited about that. It'll be a new stack. It'll be, just a lot more fun and interesting projects. So I'm kind of just next step up. So that's my, my background. Um, just kind of an overview of some of the things that I did going from a, to a different career into tech. Uh, I set goals and, and manage my time and I'll go into these a little bit more detail. Um, I, I tell everybody I, I meet who's getting into this to just, to, you gotta put yourself out there. Um, and I'll explain what I mean by that too. Uh, share your work, especially your code, uh, update your LinkedIn, and just remember that you're always and forever learning. Um, and I can also share these slides. Um, there are some resources in here uh, later. <clears throat> so for what I mean by uh, goals and time management, when, when I, at a certain point in my learning, I decided I should make some specific goals. Um, I you know, some of the things, are my kids too loud? Should I close the door? Is that all good? Thumbs up? Good? They're fine. Okay. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, I just hear them laughing down there. So um, I decided, you, you know, you, some people might want to do freelance work, contract work, uh, or maybe you want to work for somebody else. Personally, I didn't want to continue with freelance work in the long term because I, I don't like dealing with the business side of everything, the finding clients and the billing them and all, you know, doing your own taxes and I don't know, all that stuff. It just wasn't for me. 
Um, and then location, I knew I wanted to stay in Syracuse. Maybe you're open to moving and that opens you up to more positions. Um, and then I, I kind of had like a time frame that I was really pushing for, but sometimes that it's out of your hands. Um, but one thing that I, I did that I recommend to anybody is the Code Newbie Challenge. Um, if you haven't heard of it, uh, the, the woman behind it originally, she has like a couple of podcasts. She has, she has all this stuff going on. She's a, a Ruby developer, but um, I have the website on here, community.codenewbie.org slash CNC2021. They just started a new one. You can do start coding, code more, get a job. And I think there's a write more challenge, but it was really helpful for me in um, laying out certain steps that I needed to take to get a job uh, in this in this uh, field <clears throat> and it was very specific to tech like it wasn't just here's how you get a job it was here's how you get a job in tech you know here's depending on what you're doing things that you should think about um, the other thing that I did that I found super helpful was just my time management I, I think there's a couple different things a couple different traps you can get into um, one is you know always looking and looking and looking for jobs and reading through jobs and applying to jobs but um, I tried to limit myself with how much time I would spend looking through jobs and writing cover letters and resumes and, you know, updating my resume and stuff. And then, so each day I had kind of three things that I would try to check off my list, uh, looking for and applying to jobs, learning, um, and then building new projects. And, and the other thing you can get stuck in is this, what, and at, at this point, I'm assuming you guys are in this right now where you're. You're, you're just, you're learning a lot, you have to be. Uh, but then once you reach a certain point down the road, you wanna make sure you don't get stuck in tutorial purgatory, where you're just doing tutorial after tutorial, after tutorial, learning, 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 and, and really build. And I know you guys are building your capstone project, so that is great that you have that kind of jumping off point. But for me, I tried to make sure that a good chunk of my day was building, whether it was doing something freelance, doing um, something you know for somebody I knew who needed some work done um, or a personal project if I didn't have anything else to do. Um, <clears throat> put yourself out there uh, for that. What I mean is, you know, get out there in person. And obviously we're in different times now, um, post COVID, but, or I, I shouldn't say post COVID, but, you know, the, the world's a different place now. And there's a lot more virtual meetups than there were when I was doing this. So there were a lot more in-person meetups and, and I try to go to as many as I could, talk to people, um, just kind of immerse myself in this new world and, and just, you know, be like a sponge and just take it all in, see what all the different paths where I could take, see what all the different things were that I could learn. Um, and I would just listen to anybody and everybody I could. And if I didn't understand what they were saying, I, sometimes I would ask questions if I felt comfortable with them. Other times I would kind of make a mental note or write down and, and look into it later because there's so many, when you're out there um, in some of these, you know, nerdy tech environments, you get all of these, um, people bring up these things and you're just like, what is that? Like, what are they talking about? And, and that I think happens to a lot of, you know, newbies in the field and that's totally fine. And even, you know, even now I have that, I imagine Caitlin and Joey even have that because you, you can't know it all. There's just um, too much to know. So get yourself out there and really just, you know, dive into that world. And then more of putting yourself out there, um, some of the local things that you could do, uh, which you probably have heard of a lot of these already. Sorry if I'm repetitive here. Um, but there's a couple different meetup groups. Um, Caitlin mentioned that I'm part of Women in Coding. And we add our meetups to the Syracuse Software Development Meetup uh, group. And then we have, there's also Open Hack. I would recommend that one. I think they're gonna start doing in person maybe next month. And that one's nice because it brings in a variety of, of folks and they're usually working on different projects that you can talk to them about. Um, our Women in Coding meetups are gonna be virtual for the time being probably uh, for a while. And then there's another meetup group, uh, the Women in Machine Learning and Data Science, uh, Wimmel DS, I think that's how they pronounce it. but. Uh, that one, they have some interesting stuff going on too. I, you know, I think there's actually a third one that I just thought about, but I can't remember what it is. So if anybody else knows of another one or just look on Meetup, I'm sure it'll pop up. The other thing is the Slack communities that are out there. Um, you all, I think are in the Hack Upstate 
Slack group already. Um, pretty sure. Okay, good. I thought you guys froze for a second. <laughs> the few people on my screen all froze and I was like, is it me? Is it them? Anyway, uh, there's also the Syracuse.io Slack. Uh, has anybody, have you guys heard of that one? No. Okay, so, um, oh, Caitlin's putting stuff in the chat here. That's great. Thank you. Um, so if you go to Syracuse.io and then go to the bottom, there's a little um, Slack icon and you just click on that and you can join that one too. Um, so let's see, I can show you guys. So like for me, um, I have, you know, Hack Up State uh, and you have all the channels and, and everything and the direct messages in there. And then I also have, I have a couple here, but the ones that I use the most um, is also Syracuse IO. If you go on there, um, we have like a, a code newbie. I think you get, <clears throat> excuse me, added to general events and oh, intros, I think is the other one automatically. But then um, I would recommend too, we have a, a code newbies channel, which is um, kind of a mix of people who are newbies and then others who are interested in helping teach or you know answer questions for people who have them. There's language specific channels, um, you know, JavaScript one, a Python one. Um, there's a women in coding channel. Uh, when we post stuff about our events on there, there's me. Um, and, then, and then you can DM people, you know, whatever. But I'd recommend those. It's a great spot. Just, you know, you can ask questions. You can kind of see who else is out there. Oh, there's a jobs channel on there too. Definitely follow the jobs channel on both Hack Update and Circus IO. Um, sometimes there's overlap and other times stuff only gets posted to one. Uh, and then um, you can also look at the Codes Mentorship Program. I know um, I, I talked to Dana about some of you guys have mentors within um, Careers in Code, but you know when you're done there um, or anytime now, really, you can go to CodeSyracuse.org and, and click on the mentorship area. And um, we uh, we meet once a month, so we're not. It's not like you're going to get a mentor overnight, but um, we kind of talk about the different folks who've applied and, and try to find good matches for everybody. So it can take some time. So, you know, feel free to sign up soon or whenever. Uh, the other next step I kind of recommend is sharing your code. Um, are you guys on GitHub? Yeah, okay, so you're familiar. This is from GitLab because for work I use GitLab, but, <clears throat> but you know how you get all the little squares, little green and blue squares. I'm not saying you have to go and get like a solid thing of squares on your profile, but for me, it was just like a motivator and it made it more fun. Like, oh, I got another square today. I, I pushed some code, <laughs> this is fun. Uh, I, and it really, even if it's not the most brilliant thing in the world, if you're if you're building stuff, you know, push it to, to GitHub. Just add some repos, play around. I think employers would like to see that. They wanna be able to see your code and see how you think and see what you're working on. Um, and edit your GitHub profile and, and pin some repos. Um, you can, let's see if I can. <clears throat> I'm Elena. Yes. This is Latonya. Can I jump in with a question? Yes, yeah, sure. You said go. in some repos. What? What is that? Okay. <laughs> Sorry. See all that lingo. <laughs> this is what I'm talking about when you get to immerse yourself in the world because people use those those terms and you don't even realize that you're doing it. Uh, so repo is short for repository. Um, and what I mean by pin them is, so, oh gosh, here's my giant picture here, but you have, um, the, mine are old, like I haven't worked on a ton in GitHub that's been gone on GitHub except for Code Syracuse recently, but you can go in and organize, I'm not signed in right now, but if you go in, you can organize, like uh, there's a bunch of repos in here of stuff that I've, you know, added to GitHub, but you can pin ones that you want people to see first. So it's kind of like you have your little profile, just, you know, if somebody shows up there, they can see which projects you want to show off first. Um, you can add a little blurb about yourself um, just so that people, you know, add a, it doesn't have to be a picture, it could be a, um, you know, uh, what's it called? A, a little I don't know, cartoon of yourself or whatever, but, you know, add something to make it a little more personal. So it's not just this anonymous GitHub page. Sure, you're welcome. Um, and then I'll also show you in a minute when I talk about 
portfolios. Um, you can share your code in a portfolio if you if you have one. Uh, so for I, I don't think everybody needs to create a portfolio. It depends on what you're doing and what direction you want to go in. Um, for me, I wanted to go into web development, so it it kind of made sense in a way I could show what I could build. Uh, I also have a background in design. So that gave me a, a kind of a leg up because I was able to design and put together what I was building. But I'll share a resource later. If, you're, if you don't have the design skills or, or just aren't interested in it, there's other ways that you can build projects that look nice and show off your code. Um, so you also wanna, you don't have to put together um, a portfolio from scratch. Uh, if you can and it, it looks awesome, that's, that's awesome. Like that's one more project that you have to show off. But if you need to start applying for jobs, you know, in two weeks, maybe you're not going to do that, or it'll take longer than that. But I, I really wanted to throw together a quick portfolio, so I just went and grabbed a bootstrap theme and added my content to it. Um, and it was a way that I could show it off. And my goal eventually was to create, a, you know, my own portfolio that I designed and developed. And then if I just didn't have time, and I got a job, so I didn't need to. But um, <clears throat> My advice would be, you know, depending on what you're doing, maybe you throw together something really quick, or maybe you work on something if you have more time that is more polished. Um, and then also try to use or build something that you can easily add or remove projects because, you know, stuff will get out of date pretty quickly in two, three years. I, I took down my portfolio recently because it wasn't uh, reflective of my work now. So um, let me just go to... So here's what it looked like though. I'm just, this is just, um, oops. It's just on my computer right here. But uh, this is the one that I had a, a few years back. Um, I just had like a little picture of, I don't know, my computer and screen, um, a project that I was working on. I had my little blurb, here's who I am, blah, blah, blah. Um, <clears throat> and then I had links to LinkedIn and um, GitHub at the time. I, I get lovely, get lab later. And then I had I just had a few projects, um, and if you clicked on them, it went to like here's a, a website that I did for somebody. Um, I talked a little bit about it. I I found these, you know, I like I said I have a design background, so I was able to use Photoshop to put the images in here. So this might be, you know, maybe you don't get all fancy like this. Maybe you just have, you know, I talked about the design too because that was part of what I wanted to show that I could design and develop. But um, I had this project, which was for a class that I did. And I basically took existing code and, and re, um, redid a bunch of it for the various assignments. And then we had folks reviewing our code. So it wasn't just do what you want. Somebody actually reviewed it and would comment on it and you know, tell me what worked and didn't work. So I, I had a little overview of it, but then this is what I mean by you can show your code in your portfolio. I took screen grabs from my GitHub uh, account and from my the repo for this. So um, if you, depending on how familiar you guys are with it now, like green is things you've added, red is things you've taken away. So I had, you know, here's some examples of things I did for responsive design and to make this project responsive. Here's some things that I did to make it accessible. Um, so, you know, I, I figured out these things needed to be added or, or changed. And then I gave a few examples of my code. So they can see, you know, here, here's what I actually did. Um, and then I had, um, for this project, we had to fetch data and, and have it be available offline. So we had to use a um, index DB and, and store everything um, in the browser. So, <clears throat> you know, I showed some of my JavaScript and what I was doing to accomplish those tasks. Um, and that got a li little more, uh, lengthy. So th those are just some examples of things you can do. I had another project here. This one didn't show any code, but for all of them, I had a link to the, the code on GitHub. Um, so that's that's what I mean by sh share your code. Um, they, I, and I had uh, one person on the hiring team for me did say it helped that I had a portfolio because he was able to see what I could build and see my code. And he, he liked that he could see, you know, how I my process, I guess. Um, sorry, it's really hot up here, so I'm getting all red. <laughs> That's great. I'm upstairs. Um, so
So the next thing on my list was update. Oh, sorry if I run over a little. I'll, I'll try to speed it up, by the way. Um, update LinkedIn. Uh, if you do that code newbie challenge, uh, they give some great information on for things like updating LinkedIn or creating a portfolio, all of these things. But if you have experience in a certain area, try to use that to your advantage. You know, if you um, like I had a design background, so that helped. And I and I tried to show that um, somebody the other day uh, introduced herself on Slack. She was at our Women in Coding meetup last Saturday and she's in healthcare and she's learning Python um, and somebody uh, in our community Okay. Uh, he commented and he said, oh, I think healthcare and Python are a great combination. And it occurred to me, of course, you know, Josh works for a healthcare company. They're based out of San Francisco. And he does, um, I, I don't know, I know he does a lot of security, but he does a lot of other stuff in Python. I don't know specifically what he does. But my point is, like, if you have a certain background, you might be able to use that. You know, maybe you build a project that sh you think could have been helpful in your job that you're at now. Or something to show that, you know, you're kind of launching off of wh where you came from and using that experience, if you can, not, you know, not every area can, you can do that. Um, another one that uh, I would say is be willing to talk to recruiters. I, I be wary. Um, there's plenty of companies out there, not really in this area that random recruiters will contact you um, for stuff that maybe isn't the best job. Uh, but there's also plenty of really well-meaning recruiters out there. And I, I remember I emailed one person emailed me locally and she said, you know, it needs these requirements. And I wrote back and I said, you know, thanks, but I, I don't have four years experience in JavaScript, but, you know, keep me in mind for other stuff. And she, and we actually ended up meeting and talking in person. And it was great because it was kind of like a practice interview for me. I got to get a little insight into what local companies are looking for and what she's seeing in the area. She didn't give me a job. I, you know, it didn't work out in that way, but I'm still in her system. I guess if someday, you know, she has reached out to me before and I, but not the stuff I've been interested in. Um, so, so you just never know. I talked to another, um, wasn't a recruiter, but the HR person for another company. Um, I wasn't, uh, I didn't have what they were looking for, but as I'm talking to her on the phone, she kept bringing up things that I didn't know what it meant. And so I'd immediately write it down. And then, you know, so I'm sitting on the phone talking to her and I'm writing down all these new things. And I'm like, okay, these are the things they're looking for. Look this up later and then learn it. So, or, you know, and sometimes they're looking for things like, have you worked with other people and collaborated on projects? And you have to, you know, that's something that takes a little more than just Googling it. You have to, you know, figure that one out, how to do that. Uh, also, you can ask people to collaborate, uh, that you collaborate with to endorse your skills on LinkedIn. Um, they can go in and give like a little plus one, they know HTML or they know CSS, you know, you can do that for each other. Um, and then if you get somebody that really makes sense, you can ask them to write your recommendation on there. Um, there, you know, if somebody, if you did a project for somebody and, and they really liked how it turned out, you can ask them, hey, would you mind writing me a recommendation on LinkedIn? And it'll show up there like, you know, Latonia was great to work with and she really contributed in this way, you know, whatever it might be. So that's, that can be helpful. Um, and updating your profile, even if you're not in a position that's, um, that if you're not in the position you want to be in yet and you're, you're, you know, breaking into the field, one thing that the Code Newbie Challenge recommended was present a specific code focused professional title near the top. So you know, it's okay to say JavaScript developer, even if you're not actually at a company working as a JavaScript developer yet, as long as you show some of your work and you show, um, you know, show why you're putting that there. Uh, so you have to have other, you know, information on your LinkedIn to back it up, like that you, you know, took the courses here and, and things like that. So, you know, go, if you look at that challenge, I'll give you more details, but um, you wanna make your coding skills very visible on your LinkedIn. Um, you don't want it to be an afterthought on there. Uh, and then the always learning mentality, um, just to wrap things up, that's kind of a, just remember you're always learning. If you go into a job interview and they, you know, they say, well, it looks like you only have this, you know, so much experience. You say, yeah, that's true, but I love to learn. And it's, it's assuming this is true. <laughs> and um, I, and that's, and I'm excited to learn and I love this field. And this is why, 
you know, this is why I'm here. And, and, you know, just make sure you share that enthusiasm with people who are interviewing you. So don't, don't pretend like you have experience. You don't, you just are honest with them and say, this is why I'm doing this. And this is why I love it. And, you know, et cetera. Um, another thing that I did was the hundred days of code challenge. Um, if you Google hundred days of code, I should have found it. I think there's actually a website that talks about it, but um, it's a, it's a Twitter thing. It doesn't have to be on Twitter, but it's a way to hold yourself accountable. And you just code, even if it's just for 30 minutes for a hundred days in a row. And it like really gets you going. It might be a good like stepping off point after all this, or maybe you start now, I don't know. But that's, uh, oh, here's some resources. Um, Credle.io is a, a resume builder. Um, it's nice because a lot of places ask for a PDF of your resume. So if you have it on LinkedIn, that's one thing, but then you might need to get them a PDF. I do think LinkedIn might actually offer that option now. I'm not positive, but I saw something on there the other day with a resume builder on there. So that might be an easier option, but <clears throat> uh, exorcism.io, I thought was a nice place to do some code exercises and get people to review it for you. Um, and then front, front end mentor.io, um, like I was saying before, if you don't have the design skills, but you want to build new projects, they're a great place you can find sample website designs that you can then build. Um, so it's, you know, they'll give you the, the samples and then you can take that and, and build something. Um, so there's my, my presentation there. Any questions? I feel like I really rattled off everything super quickly. Oh, I'm sorry, in the chat we've got, send us a copy. Yeah, you know, I might have the link. I'll grab the link for you and put it in here. How many years did it take from your main career to like decide that you want to do a change? Um, let's see here. Uh, here's the link, sorry, I'm just... <laughs> I put this in the chat real quick. So that, I guess that's complicated um, in a way. I I had like a really winding career um, and, and that this helped me too. So I, I went, uh, I got a liberal arts degree for um, in college and that didn't really give me a solid base for much. So I, I went to graduate school for landscape architecture um, and there I learned I, I learned design. Uh, so that's what gave me that design background. It, in the end, um, I started that program right as the housing market was crashing and then they were laying off all the landscape architects everywhere. <laughs> so it wasn't the best time to get into the field. So for all I know, I would still be doing that if I hadn't, um, if that hadn't happened. But uh, I, I, that's when I did some community development and environmental work and then um, where I was working, it just wasn't working for me. So that's why I started my own business as an artist. So I guess uh, a couple years. <laughs> but when I started learning and then got a job, probably um, about a year and a half. And uh, some people can do it quickly like that. Some people can do it even quicker. Others, it takes longer. You just got to keep pushing. It's, it's tough. I did. I also had a baby in the middle of all that. Um, Joey remembers seeing me at JavaScript meetups with my giant baby belly <laughs> um, because I was persistent and I was just like, I know once this baby's born, I will have a lot less time. <laughs> so I was out there learning as much as I could. I, that was actually my second child. So um, it helped in a way because I was familiar with newborns and I knew like she'd be hanging out, you know, just newborns don't move much and I'd be on my computer, <laughs> She's, you know, once I started sleeping again. Anyway, um, it, it's tough. It's different for everybody, the time frame. <laughs> uh, oh, the link for exorcism. That one was exorcism.io. Um, did I miss any questions? No, I think so. I have one if no one else has one right now. Although it just sounds like someone said something. No? Okay. What are, your thoughts, what are your thoughts about using CodePen or um, Code Sandbox as part of the portfolio 
I'm trying to balance out what I um, present for people who are techie and developers with folks who are not, but still want to purchase those skills. And I'm just curious what you think. Yeah, that's an interesting idea. Um, I think, so like you would have links to your projects that are things that you've built on Code Sandbox or CodePen or something. Yeah, I mean, I was thinking some of it, I would hope it would, it would be interactive. Like you can go in and um, like when we did the calculator app, you can actually test it and um, yeah. stuff. I know it sounds really basic, but I just want people to be able to see, um, you know, what I can do. You know, I think that's a good idea. Um, I, when I had links to projects, like if they were, if it was a live project, I had the link to the live website. Um, but I know like GitHub pages, GitHub, you can do the thing called GitHub pages where you, it's not, you don't need a domain for it, but you can link to that. Um, also Netlify is what I used. Um, you can just take a, a repo and make it live and they give you kind of a, a dummy link that works for it, but it's not some kind of, you know, you don't have to buy the domain. I think you can do the same thing with CodePen or um, Code Sandbox. You can just, you can link to that. So you might have like a little overview of it and then link to it from there. thinking about that, those JavaScript meetups. <laughs> I was always hungry. I always had my snacks there. You're welcome. Hopefully, yeah, I'm glad. Hopefully it was helpful. Um, I don't know. I, I, I'm not sure what other speakers you guys have had or will have. So, yeah. And also feel free to reach out to me. Um, I, uh, I, I know a couple of you guys or some, a couple of you ladies anyway, from women in coding meetups. Um, but you can you know, find me on LinkedIn. Um, I'll leave my, uh, I think it's just, see if I can find myself. Um, or on Slack, I'm just on Elena on Slack, pretty, pretty basic, but, and I'm, I'm always on there, so you can see me. Um, or uh, yeah, I guess LinkedIn or Slack are the places to find me. <clears throat> oh yeah, I forgot Joey's in healthcare now. Don't you work where Josh works? I do, we are coworkers. There we go, there's a good example. So when I was saying, I don't know what Josh does. I don't know what Joey does either. <laughs> Yeah, Josh is uh, security, and okay. I'm front end. You're front end. Okay. But yeah, I think also, you know, healthcare, you have, you know, all sorts of lingo, and I don't, I don't know, things that it might be helpful to know going into it. So. Well, I don't, uh, any other questions, I guess, or I don't want to take up your learning time here. All right, doesn't look like there's any other questions. So thank you, Annalena. Yes, thank you. you again. Good luck, everybody. Have fun, enjoy it. I'll uh, see you Bye. later. See you around. You. All right, see ya. All right, so awesome. Haven't seen her in a while, that was nice. <clears throat> okay, so questions regarding uh, what we've done up until up until Thursday of last week. Any any questions in on React before we get started on um, continuing on with the project, or any clarifications that will need to happen <clears throat> before we keep going? Just getting myself situated here, so. Um, feel free to unmute and ask a question if you need to. I had a clarification question. This is this yeah. Me. When we are um, basically migrating our code into React, do you have to do all of it, or can you just use part part of the code for React? Does that make sense? I, I feel like I'm not really articulating my question, but I'm just wondering: do you have to take everything you have and make it React, or can you just do parts of it? You can do parts of it. Right, so React is nice in the fact that you can render it pretty much anywhere <clears throat> uh, on your page. 
it's so if you remember, let me pull, let me pull the um, let me share the screen, pull up the project again. <clears throat> Reconfigure Zoom here. All right, so everyone can see my VS Code. Okay, so if I go down, collapse this stuff real quick. If I look at index.js file, this says, okay, I'm gonna render this app, right? Cause react dom dot render. I'm gonna render this, this chunk of react code inside an element with an ID of root, right? So if I look at public index HTML, scroll down, here's that div. So you can render, it doesn't have to be an entire application. It could just be just a small component on the screen. In fact, um, when I worked at Raymore and Flanagan, we didn't render the entire application in React. What we did was the back end was a, a CMS, which is a content management system. So if you think of like a really advanced WordPress for e-commerce, right? And then what it would do, it was it would serve up an HTML document. And on that HTML document are all the little divs that the content authors would have placed to show the different types of content they want to show, whether it's a search grid or it's some sort of product detail or something like that, right? And then what we would do is we say, okay, for every div on the screen, we'll render a React app, uh, a tiny little React application for it, which just happens to be just that one component, right? And they are littered all over the page. So you can literally pick and choose where you want to put your React application, whether it's a full app or just like some component, right? So I could add another one in here. Let's say there's, you know, some, some more content here. And then further down the page, I've got another div with an ID of, we'll just say footer, right? And so I can create an, a React application that's only a footer. That's all it is. And I can dictate where it's on screen. So absolutely, absolutely, you can put just part of it, or you can do the whole thing. It's completely up to you. Does that make sense? Cool. It's a great question, though. Um, yeah, that's that's actually a fantastic question. Um, we'll get into at the let's see on Thursday. Hopefully, we'll be wrapping up um, this project, and then I'll touch upon what it would take to take this, create a build, like a bundle out of this thing, and then what do you need from this in order to serve it up to some server, right? What do you need to pass this to? So. Is that the same as the splash page you said we might be doing? Uh, no, that's, that's, oh, okay. that's, yeah. I just want to make sure I touch upon how you turn something like this into something you can serve up, you know, to a server somewhere and use as an application. All right, cool. So let's close that. Any other questions before we get started? Let me open up my chat again, close that. Is there a tool for converting HTML code into React? VS Code. So you can, just how we took and copied the source code off of the, um, the Bootstrap page to grab that template, we literally pasted it right into our VS Code, changed a few property names, and we we're good to go. So it's, that's literally your tool. Okay. Yeah, I wasn't sure what day it was. Um, I think Jesse's usually on for those ones, right? Yeah, okay. Yeah, they're tomorrow. Sorry, Jaheel. Okay, so um, any other questions um, as we, in regards to React yeah, before we go or before we get started? All right, cool. So has everyone pulled the latest from the repo? I see nodding heads. Any questions on that? Um, I pulled this weekend. Do I need to still pull? No, I, I uploaded it literally Thursday night. So if you pulled it over this weekend, you got the latest. Thank you. Cool. So today, 
we're going to continue working on the search page. I had originally thought I would start working on the cart page, but um, <clears throat> I think it's better that we continue with search um, simply because there's some aspects that I wanna make sure that we cover. And I think we've got everything for the, oh wait, we, we finished the product detail page, right? I think that's the last thing we did. Let me double check. In fact, I'm gonna do this. I'm just going to NPM start. And we'll take a look to see how far we got. It's a long weekend. <laughs> we got most of everything I've done the past couple weeks. So we've got this. All right, so we're rendering that. Oh, the one thing we did not do was we didn't add anything to our cart. Now, we could do that portion, but in order to actually like, we wanna work on the cart page before we do that because otherwise if we add something to the cart, we won't know that we added it to the cart. We don't have a page to render it on. Um, so I think what we'll do is we'll go back to search and there's some really good stuff to learn in search that we still have to do. Okay, cool, sounds good. Um, <clears throat> so what we'll do here is we're gonna open up search page folder inside our components folder. And we're gonna open up search page.js. Where is my, oh, here it is. And so far, this is what we've got. We've got a placeholder for search input, placeholder for search options like sorting and filtering. And of course we've finished the, the search grid. So we're good on that part. So I think what we'll do is we'll work on search input first that way, um, we can start typing things in that we want to search for. So right now, we can't search for anything specific. We just kind of get everything back. So we want an input field. If I bring up the finished site, right, I can type in here and I can say anything with a hotel, hit enter. Okay, those are the packages that include hotels, right? Anything with water. Okay, there's some stuff that has water in it. Um, or if it's blank, I can hit enter and it just returns everything. And so that's what we'll work on for the start of this class. We'll see if we get into the filters by the end. Um, you may think, well, it's just a just an input box, right? But there's actually a lot of stuff that goes into search or that could go into search. So we're gonna work on that. So we're gonna be working with um, forms and um, more event handling. I grab my handy dandy notes. Now, what we do have, get this out of the way, we do have a placeholder for search input. Oops, that's the less file. And there's nothing in here, of course. So we'll start here. So if you open up search input.js, we'll start creating this thing. Uh, okay. This is going to be a pretty simple to start, but we'll start by, well, we already have our, um, let's import our, our, our SAS file, we'll import dot slash search input dot SCSS. So we've got our styles. And we'll export. Excuse me, Joey. My search page is full. You want, like, I can show you what I have in here. Should I just delete this stuff? Should I have anything here? Are you in the working folder or the completed folder? Um, I should be in the working folder. Search page.js should have something. We're in search input.js. Oh, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> yeah, don't delete search uh, page. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> <laughs> that would make, uh, yeah, that wouldn't work. <laughs> okay, so we're going to export const search input equals, we're going to take props. So we need to pass some stuff. Well, we need to pass one thing. And we'll return some markup. And give it a class name. 
Well, search input. Everyone a second to catch up there. Yeah, because I'm slow today. All right, so the search input consists of three different things. One is the input field itself. Uh, two is the button to, that someone could actually click. Actually, let me pull this back up. I'll do this so that it's not taking up the whole screen. Oh, Zoom is really not wanting me to get back here. All right, so I'll this right here so people can still see up there. All right, so I have the search input box. I've got a button and there's an icon on the button. So really that's, as far as markup goes, that's really all it is. And if you remember, we used Font Awesome for using our icons up here. So we're just gonna pull in the same component that renders the magnifying glass right here. Mm -hmm. So we can do that, that'll be nice and quick. So the first thing we need is our input element. That's a self-closing tag. Yeah. Okay. And then this is gonna have a class name, oops. Oh man, Zoom is all over the place. All right, it's class name equals, and we'll do search input, double underscore, input uh, because here's our search input SAS file. In fact, we should take a look at this real quick. We've got a class for the button, for the icon, and for the input. And so everything's already hashed out for us here. So this will be for the input, the name, this is gonna be part of a form. And whenever you have an input, any sort of input that um, adds data to that form, you need to give it a name. So if you remember, if you guys worked with forms in just straight up HTML, if you have an input or a select element or a checkbox, you have to give it a name so that when you submit the form data, those names represent like the keys on the object that gets created, right? So the name will be, uh, that'll come from props. So props.name. So if we wanted to reuse this element on a different page with a different name, we could do that. We'll also create a button. That's the button. Oh, we do need our font awesome icon. Now, uh, before we do that, let's just give this a class name. Search input double underscore button. And this particular search input is going to be the only input in the form. So if we were to take a look over here, this is actually going to be a separate thing down here. So right here, we'll have to wrap this in a form tag so that we can submit. Then this button over here, the thing we're creating now, has to be a submit button. So we're going to do pipe equals. And the reason we're not doing input of type submit is the fact that we need something inside this thing. And it's far easier to do it this way. Because input tags are self-closing, so you can't, they can't actually have children. Um, so, but we can give a type of submit to a button and that'll act just fine um, inside a form as a submit button. The next thing we need to do is we need to import that font awesome stuff. And we did that in the header. So to make this easy on ourselves, if you go up to your header JS file, is it header? Yes. We can grab this stuff here and copy it. It's literally the same thing we're gonna be using anyway. Go back to search input, paste that in. Now we don't need the shopping cart icons, so we can get rid of that. Uh, 
now we just say icon, self-closing, give it a class name. We do have classes for that. Give search input double underscore icon. And the icon we're going to give it is that FA search icon up here. We'll save that. Now, if you remember when we briefly touched upon error, or I'm sorry, event handling, I think we used some input before. Yeah, we did use an input because it was in your exercises. Um, you have to give it an on change handler, right? So we would say on change, right? But we're going to do things a little bit differently here. Now, by default, since this is, well, let me go back to my notes. So because it's part, gonna be part of a form, HTML will allow us to, um, we'll be able to take advantage of the HTML, the underlying HTML, and we can grab the data out of the form, um, the, the HTML form and use that for updating things. And I'll show you how to tap into that. All right, cool. So is everyone caught up to this so far? I need to leave this on the screen. Yes, can you make your text a little bit bigger though? In VS Code? Uh, I can go once. Let's yeah, see. that's perfect. Thank you. All right. I'll have to drop this down. Let's move this over. I'm running out of real estate here. Let's save this. Okay, in fact, I'll, do this. I'll put this in the, um, the Slack channel as well. Paste code. So this is search input.js. So you can grab it out of search, um, out of the pasted code if you need to as well. All right, so we can close header, we can close search input. We're basically done with the search input here. All we've really done is created a wrapper to designate our component in the DOM. Uh, we've also as our, our um, single point of return for our return statement. We've got an input text box uh, with a name that we'll give from our um, parent component, a button that has an icon in it, and the button is of type submit. So we know we need to add a form to this. And the reason I'm not putting the form around this particular component um, is because where the form is submitted, we have to do some additional logic. Um, and we can't just like house all the logic in a subcomponent when the parent component needs some of that data. And there's no way to pass data back up like via props to a parent component. So we're gonna do the form stuff in the parent component, which will happen to be uh, search page.js. And this will just be our, it's just an input. That's all this thing is. Just a style of input. All right, so if we go back to search page.js, we'll import our new component, search input from search input. And VS Code gives us a nice uh, autocomplete now. <laughs> We've gotten a lot better over the years. Um, it does a pretty good job of figuring out where to import stuff um, as a helper. So now we can actually come down here, get rid of the search input right here, and just do, in fact, before I do that, 
So I think I'm going to have to wrap this thing. Yeah. So let's let's do this. Let's create the code that will wrap the input before we actually put the input on the screen. Let's do that. So here. <laughs> I've got this split out into uh, rows and columns and things. I'll make sure I'm on the right one. Options row. Okay, so yeah. So here, we'll create a div. You could just delete the contents from the other div. Um, we'll give it a class name of just a few, just a few classes. So this will be a row. We'll have padding left of four. Heading left on a medium sized screen of zero, heading right of four, and same thing, heading right on a medium screen of zero. Just some padding styles there. Inside here, we'll create another div. Now, what I'm going to about to do is I'm going to use columns as for just laying the contents out. Um, so one of those columns won't have anything in it, and its sole purpose is just to take up space so that the input field is centered. So what we'll do <clears throat> is this will be our first column, which will be col-md-3. So on a medium-sized screen, this will take up three column units. And if I come back to my Completed app real quick. There's one thing I do want to point out. So this is the three units that I was just mentioning. And there's three units over here. So if I want this thing to be centered, I already know I'm taking up six units. So this will be six units wide. But the, the cool thing about Bootstrap is that if you don't define, right? Can you put, yep. If you don't define what's over here and you just add another column in, it'll just take up whatever space you tell it to. Um, and it'll just not render anything over here. You don't have to put a third column in here and give it. I mean, you could if you needed to be explicit or put some content in there, uh, but we don't really need to do that. But there is one thing we do need to factor in. And if we, this is for a desktop display, like a medium sized screen and up. But if we wanted to look at this on mobile, that search bar goes all the way across. So it's basically 12 units. So we need to factor that in when we're creating this spacer column over here. So what we'll do, oh, I just clicked off my notes. <laughs> we'll come back over here and we're gonna give it some more classes. So on mobile, we want it to, a display of none, right? We want that spacer column to go away. But the problem with it is, is since we labeled it as something that's mobile first, if we don't give it a reference to a larger screen size, it will never render at all. So we need to make sure we, we plug that back in. So if we do D for display, MD block. So on a medium sized screen, this will restore a block display. So by default, it's displayed as none, like so for mobile. But once we get up to a screen size of medium or higher, it'll display it as block type, which means it'll be visible and it'll be three units wide. Well, right. Tony wants to know if the class orders matter, like which one you put first. For classes, when we're defining it like this. Now for, for these particular bootstrap classes, it doesn't really matter um, simply because they target two different things, right? Um, but classes do, like the order of things do matter with CSS, which classes you apply first, they do matter. Um, it just so happens that the way they have, bootstrap has this set up, I don't think this order matters for, for this. By default, like when I've always used Bootstrap, I always think of mobile first. So I always put my mobile first, my mobile classes first anyway. So I never really even, I don't think I haven't really experimented to see if it would. 
<laughs> uh, but I'm pretty sure it'll adhere to it. Uh, but if you are defining classes, if you assign like your own classes, right? If I were to put a class here, let's just say it was a class of blue, that's something I define. And let's say this class down here defines it as white or red or whatever, um, that will override it. I'd have to put my class last, right? Because that'll get applied last. Same thing with styles, right? So the, the last in wins. Now, since there's nothing in this div, we can do a self-closing element like this, and that's perfectly fine. It won't contain any children. Were we supposed to take the class name search, search page off of that first div under return? Uh, we put that in there from before. Was it in there before? It's on mine anyway. Oh, let's add it in. Search page. I may have uh, gotten rid of that by accident. Yep, so we definitely want that. Okay, cool. So the next thing we're going to do is we're going to create our column that's going to hold our input. So the class name will be call dash md dash six. Now I'm, I'm not defining a mobile one. By default, if you don't define the mobile one, it'll just be 12 units, 12 columns wide until it hits a size, right? So by default, this will be 12 units, but medium screen size isn't up, and it'll start to be six units wide. It's just a bootstrap thing. All right, so inside here, we're gonna create a form tag. And inside the form tag, we'll place our search input element. We'll give it a name of query. Why query? Well, if we look at the call we're making the product search, it takes three parameters, query, filter by, and sort by. And since this, we can pretty much tell that this is gonna be the parameter we're gonna need for our search input, right? That's the one where you actually type something instead of just selecting from a dropdown. All right, so with form, Form takes a prop called on submit. And with that, give it a callback. And that takes an event. Typically, what you'll do, uh, what you'll see, um, if it's not labeled event, if you see an E there, that's a sh you'll see that a lot in components like. Um, that are out there, E for events, just because it saves typing. <laughs> it just says a heads up on that. Now, the first thing you do when you submit a form, what happens? If it's in just plain HTML form, anyone remember? So what it does is it reloads the page. Yes, exactly. <clears throat> reloads the page, which we don't want to happen, right? So we need to prevent the default behavior. So we can just say events, you got it. No, the MD is still medium. It's a medium size display. Um, what I was saying for, oops, where's my cursor? For this is that because I didn't find the mo I did not define a mobile designation. If I'm on a mobile size screen, it defaults to 12 units. Perfect. Um, where was I? I was, oh yes, on submit. So we need to prevent the default behavior. So we'll say event dot prevent default. That's a function, so we'll call it. And that'll prevent the page from reloading. So we can handle what we, what we want to happen in a nice seamless um, user experience. 
But now what we need to do is there's, there's something that we need to do here. And we need to um, set the next query to our input data. All right, so that's the next thing we need to do uh, because we need to make another call. So as soon as the user types something into the search box, hits enter or presses the button, we want to make another call to our search, our product search endpoint, grab a new result set and display it. Well, we already have the call right here, right? We're already doing that. But the only time we're doing it is we're doing it the first time that the component mounts to the DOM. But we need to do it after something else happens. So now we can't put this use effect down in here. We can't do anything like that. So instead, what we'll do is we're going to use state again. We're going to use another piece of state. And we're going to hold on to whatever the user typed. So we'll say const uh, let's try, oh, query set query equals use state. And by default, we'll have an empty string. It's by default. And now we have access to this query. So guess what we can do down here? We can do this. So by default, when this thing loads, query will be an empty string, just like it was when we had it defined here, except now I'll be passing it in as the, the parameter that's gonna to go to my product search endpoint. And because query, the key is the same name as the variable query, we can just do query. So that was that, um, what was it called? Object parameter shorthand, I think. I think that. All right, so now we have a query. So now we get, now when we update it, we're, we're one step closer to passing in uh, what the user actually typed in. So let's come back down here to on submit. Now that we have a place to store that data, now underneath, when the user's typing in an input form, in an input field that's within a form, that form data, or I'm sorry, that the value of that input field is, it's available whenever, whenever we want it. We just have to go ahead and grab it. Um, so here's what we're gonna do. We're going to, say set, well, let's do it this way. I'm gonna say const, we'll say nah, new query value, or no, sorry, let's, let's name this better. Naming's hard. <laughs> there's, there's two really hard things in programming. The first is naming, and the second is something called cache invalidation, but naming, naming's tough. So we'll, we'll call this, um, I know, let's search, input value, we'll say that, because that, that's explicitly what it is. And this is gonna look a little weird, but we're gonna set that equal to event dot query selector. And inside the selector, we're gonna say input, with square brackets, name equals query. And at the end, we'll say dot value. Anyone want to take a guess what this what's going on here? I'm gonna I'm mixing a little bit of React with a little bit of. Um, what would you call this uh, DOM JavaScript provided uh, functionality? Now, th there's the before I get into why what this is doing. The reason why I'm doing this is because I didn't want to create a whole like form component library just to do this simple example. 
And I didn't want to pull in one that was already created out there because they get a little complex and going over forms um, can get really complex. There's a lot of complexity to it. So I tried to keep, this is probably the simplest way you can pull data out of a form without actually using the form component library or one of the simplest ways. So what we're doing is the res what we're putting into search input value is the result of looking at the event. So the submit event. So when someone actually clicks enter or presses the button on the input field or the input the search input component, because that button is of type submit, this form will you know, do its regular submit routine. Now we're preventing the default behavior. Okay, that's cool. But we still have access to the event that occurred. Now that event represents a form. And inside that form, you can think of it as, okay, here's a block of um, HTML DOM nodes where all this form data is being held. <clears throat> so do you remember what query selector does? Do you remember document.query selector? You guys go over that in HTML or, okay. I see a lot of uh, confused looks. Okay, before we get into this, we need to know what query selector is in order for this to make sense. So I am going to pull open our current working app. Ah, see there's their input field, that's cool. So let's target that. It's even, as you can see, even the, uh, Columns are working. That's a relief. <laughs> All right. So if I were to say document dot, well, before I do that, let's open up. Let's take a look at the elements that are actually on our page. My elements. So if you want to follow along with this, um, that'll be helpful. So if we're looking at our HTML, We've got a bunch of stuff in here. You know, we've got our root div. There's our app. Here's our layout, right? There's the search page. Here's all the different things on the search page. Um, here's this div right here, right? Here's my form. Here's search input, right? All these different things. If I wanted to select something with JavaScript out of the DOM and I wasn't using React, there's a, there's a few methods available to us for doing that. If I were to come down to my console, let me just collapse this so we don't see all this stuff here. Let's document dot, I could say get element by ID. I could do that. If I give it an ID of root, if I hover, see how I hover this over this thing? It's actually highlighting the entire page. So it's actually, what it's doing is it's highlighting this, this div. So now I have a reference to this div in the DOM. So I can, I can access, I can access it the same way, right? Because all it is, is a reference to it. If I wanted to access it, I could access it the same way using a different selector. So document dot query selector. And this takes a CSS selector to select the thing in the DOM that you want to target. Now, if you remember um, in CSS, how do you target a class? I'm actually typing down here. Oh, my chat's all messed up. How do we target a class? What's the selector we need to target a class? Oh, so yes, exactly, a dot. So I could say dot, and then whatever the class is. I'm typing in chat now instead of over on my screen. I'd say dot and then wherever the class name is. If I wanted to grab something with an ID, what do I use? Yeah, pound, hash, whatever the correct term is these days. Right, and I could say pound root. Now I've got it. So query selector is just another way to get references to things um, that are DOM nodes. Now, when you submit a form, you have that event, in that event, you have access to 
the form itself, which we're, now you can start grabbing data out of it. So query selector, since it allows us to target things using a CSS selector, we can do all kinds of neat stuff to grab data out of there. In fact, I'm gonna clear my console here. If I were to search for this input, this input right here, one way to do it is I could say document dot query selector. And then I will target something that has class search input, double underscore input. Now it highlights it. I could do it that way. Uh, but since I already have access to the form, well, this, this DOM node's already in the form. So I don't need to like, what, what if I had two different inputs in there, right? So what if I had a name, a last name, or you know, all these other things that could be in the form? I don't want to select everything with a class of form or class of this. That's just not really great practice. Because uh, what happens if I say document dot query selector, and I just want, let's say, div. I want to select divs. Well, it's going to give me the first div it finds. So what if what if this element wasn't the first search input element? What if there were two? I'd only ever get the first one, and I could never target the second. So instead, I can target things with a very specific name. Now you notice this has a name of query. So how do I do that? Well, I come back over here. Oh, and I, and I don't select a different file. Hold on. I got to get my Zoom to tools out of the way. I selected that. Um, so what I'm saying here is event. That represents the submit event of the form, which gives me access to the form DOM node. And I can query that portion of the DOM. I can say, hey, give me the input with a name attribute set to the value of query. We look at our search input, the name attribute is set to the value of query. So I just targeted that input element and I could just access values off of it, like dot value. So I can actually see what the user has typed at that point in time. Does that make sense? See thumbs ups, head nods, cool. Yep, so you can target anything in the DOM like this um, and you just pass it a CSS selector that's valid. And as long as you get that back, you're good to go. Now, if I wanted to be really extra careful, I would say something, the next line I would say something like, if search, you don't have to type this out. This is just for an example. Um, is not equal to like, no, right? Then I could go ahead and proceed. But I'm highly confident that this is the only name equals query thing on this page. But just as a, a way to prevent things, especially if you have a lot of reusable components, you want to make sure you're not trying to grab dot value off of something that doesn't actually exist. All right. So now that we have that, yep. Sorry, the square brackets there have nothing to do with an array. That's just the way you type that. That is. That is the uh, query selector um, syntax for accessing an attribute, right? So if I wanted to attribute the class, I do it like that, right? That's the attribute I gave to that DOM component or like data dash ID, if I gave it some sort of special data thing, right? Um, this is the name, it's just CSS selector syntax. It's not an array. Okay, I, I did understand what you were doing inside the brackets. I just yep. yeah, I just want to double check about the brackets. Thanks. You can think about it this way. So if you use square brackets on an object, what are you accessing? You're accessing that key, right? So you could also think about it that way. Think of input as some object, and you're accessing it the name that name of that attribute the same way you're accessing object dot whatever key name it is. So you can think about it that way. There's a uh, Many ways to think about these things. Hopefully one of them sticks. <laughs> uh, 
Okay, so now that we have the value, so that the user clicked the submit button, an event happened, we stopped the page from refreshing. At this moment in time, we're grabbing whatever the user typed in that input box, whether it's empty or not. And now we're going to say set query equal to search input value. Now set query was that updater function for the query state. So every time we hit submit, that stuff's gonna go uh, up into the, uh, the query variable or state variable. Now that we have access to it, now we can make a new search. Well, how do we do that? Anyone wanna take a guess? We've updated this. This only fires when the DOM mounts. So how can we use this later on after the DOM mount, after it mounts to the DOM? Anyone wanna take a guess? Use effect, correct. But what about, what about use effect? I'll give you a hint. We can use the same use effect we're using now. Anyone remembers? So this, the first thing we pass is a callback. Dependencies, yes, you got it. We need to listen for a change when query changes. When that changes, this thing's gonna fire. And when that fires, the new value of query is gonna go out to the backend. It's gonna bring back a new set of data or the same data. If we type something that happens that bring back all the search items, right? If it's something super generic, like if every search, every item contained the letter E, use E, well, you're gonna get back everything anyway. But now we can actually start typing over here. Let's say water, hit enter. Oh, query selector is not a function. Why are you not a function? Oh, okay, this is my bad. Event.target, that query selector. Sorry about that, folks. Um, so same with um, on change events, event.target.value. Well, the event.target is actually the form, right? That's the thing that was submitted. So that's my bad. I got a little too eager with that. So let's <laughs> save that. Yeah, I make mistakes too. Everyone's prone. Now I type water. Okay, now I'm actually getting back a curated result. Let me go back here. And I will paste this. Now that it's correct, I'll paste this into uh, uh, the Slack chat. Good thing I didn't paste it yet. Search page .js just created or just yeah created query yes sir all right so all the code is in the slack chat if you need to catch up is anyone seeing new results coming back when they type in is anyone getting that yet We had over here, I'll type forest. I get different things. If I get rid of it, hit enter, I get everything. Is that working for people yet? I'm seeing some heads starting to nod. If not, just copy and paste that search page JS. Yes, cool. So people are saying search CS. Uh, that's yeah, so check the, if you're only, yeah, if you're not seeing, cool, cool. If all you see is the icon or whatever, just 
you need the search input JS stuff. I had it, but closed the window. Whoops. <laughs> All right, cool. So that's pretty cool, right? I mean, we're just listening for a change. Whenever we see that change, we fire off a new request, we get some new stuff. I'm gonna leave this list for now. Get more on the screen. All right, so we think, I think that's it for search. That's it for the search input. Oh, no, sorry, it's not. There's one more thing um, related to search that we didn't mock up or didn't create a place folder for. And that's for, let me bring this over. If you notice, if I type, we see nothing up here currently. If I type water, it tells me, oh, I got three results for this. So we need to populate something up here to tell the user how many results actually came back. We can see down here, we'll, we'll do the same thing down here when we create the options uh, component. So now let's focus on this right here. Move that off. All right. So below search page, but before the new row that we created, we're gonna create a new div. And we'll say class name equals search page, double underscore, results for. Now we're gonna have to do some logic in here because we don't want this to display by default. We only want it to display if the user actually types something in, we want to display the results we're getting back for their query, not the default one. So how do we do that? Well, we have to do some evaluation. First, we need to make sure there's items that actually returned because if there's no items, why would we display results? Right? So we'll say items. If this is truthy, we're gonna do something. But we also wanna make sure that we don't just display it for every item. We only wanna display this when the user actually searched for something specific. So we wanna make sure that the user actually typed in a query. So we want to check for the truthiness of that. We'll do another um, logical and. Then we can start rendering whatever it is that we want to render. So for this, we're going to do some back ticks. We're going to do some string interpolation. And first thing we want to check is how many items came back. So we can check the length of items, right? Because items is an array of objects. So we can check the length property of that array. Then we could say results for, we're going to put some regular quotes, and then we're going to evaluate query. So we'll have quotes around the user's query text. All right, so now if I come over here, I'll refresh this, see nothing. Of water, oh, I see three results for water. Now it's kind of messed up here because, thinking my styles are off. Uh, probably my styles are off. Do I have correct styles in here? Results for, Page. Page. Oh, I know why. We're not pulling in the styles for the uh, search page. Let's import those. So we're going to pull in search page. Dot la or not less. Sass. Sorry, I use less at work. We'll pull in the styles for that. I just saw a change over here to the right. There we go, that's better. Now we actually see the, the intended styles. 
So here I could delete this out, right? If I actually type for maybe something like a mountain, you know, I get one result. Now, of course, you'll, you might wanna do some additional logic for pluralization. So if this, if this bugs you, which it bugs me, <laughs> one results, that doesn't make sense to me. Um, so <laughs> you can do extra logic for that. Um, in fact, yeah, a real quick way to do it is to say, right, we're gonna wrap logic around this S. So if I have items.length greater, oops, sorry, greater than zero, oh, let's see, greater than one, then I want S, otherwise I want nothing. One result from mountain just to make sure water, your results for water. So I'll copy and paste everything here into, again, this is however you want to handle it. Search page. JS with results text. All right, so that's now in chat. And we're coming up at a good point where we can take a break. Um, is everyone getting these results rendering at least? I see mostly head nods. I see one no. Are you, get, uh, are you at least rendering the search grid still? You're not rendering anything? Okay. Uh, are you getting errors on the screen? Well, I can't fix the internet stuff, unfortunately. <laughs> um. <laughs> yeah, not I'm getting that failed to compile thing again. I did have the page loaded for a while when I initially started. So, and yes, yeah, so fail to compile would mean, um, yeah, your files are not like, um, they're not sound, right? Like they're not, they're not completed. There's an error somewhere in the syntax. Mm -hmm. Probably uh, something I missed you were typing. Um, so what you can do is, so we, we've only touched um, search input JS and search page JS. And mm -hmm. both of those are in the chat. So if you want to copy paste those in. See if that works. Yeah, see if you can get it to go that okay. way. Uh, Thank you. Yep. Any questions so far? Is this making sense? Like this is a very basic search. We're going to add more to it. We'll do more things. But um, oh, I can't open Slack. Oh, that stinks. I don't know why not. I will, let's see. I just need the um, search input. For some reason, it doesn't like my one line, the export comp search page equals props. And I don't know what I did wrong. I that just think that one line based on the error. On search input? Um, yep, search input dot there. So you should be exporting cons to search input, not export cons search page. Let me grab the code. Oh, I was just stuck it in the wrong place. Oh, okay. Good. I think I think that's what you're saying. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah, we should be exporting the same variable name as the name of the file, basically. But just in case, I'll copy it to you, your chat. So Joey, I want the second search page.js code from Slack, right? Because you updated it? Yes, whatever the last the one. The last one, great, thank you. All right, cool. So you should have the pasted code in your chat. Any questions so far, um, aside from the little hiccups that we've seen, anything that that we're doing that doesn't make sense or, or anything. What questions you got? 
I see thumbs ups. We're good. All right. So um, if we're good for now, then I think we could go on break. Give us a nice break there. And then when we come back, um, we'll try to finish up the rest of the search page with the filtering and the sorting. And that'll basically complete it. So which should take up pretty much the rest of, of today's class. And then tomorrow, we'll get into adding stuff to the cart. You know, we'll create this, the cart page and then we'll add stuff to the cart and watch it render on the, on the cart page. And then we'll be able to update, you know, the quantities, whether we're on the product page for adding or removing, um, adding and removing on the cart page itself. All right, so we'll come back at, let's see, 7.08, what do we think? Is, uh, how about 7.30? Is that giving everyone enough time? That's okay. great. Okay, we'll come back at 7.30 and then we'll finish out the uh, search page. And if you have just a second, Joey? Yeah. Um, things are rendering. So Good. I type in water and got, you know, the waterfall retreats. So I thought, okay, I'll keep water in the search box and I'll type in retreat thinking it would bring back that one thing, but it brings back nothing. So what it's doing is it's searching for that exact thing. So mm, it's, free. It's, not like, it's not like the, um, this is a very simplistic search, like on the back end. So if I were to type waterfall, I see waterfall, if I type mm -hmm. waterfall retreats, I still get it. But if I type water retreat, it doesn't. It's okay. It's not, it's the search I wrote is very basic and it's not smart enough to do nice. and retreat. It's literally looking for this text. Yeah, in, I understand. In, so um, yeah. when I typed in just water, it did bring back waterfall though. So I thought, oh, let's just see if I can just push it a little further. No, that's, you know, in the library profession, you do a lot of different searches. Some yeah. work better than others. So I was just wondering, no, that's great. No, this is just, yeah, it's real basic. It's That's like, awesome. hey, this, is this exact phrase somewhere in that okay. file name or description? That's literally, yeah. <laughs> literally I'm, it. I'm one of those power users that searches and puts the search engine to its pace. <laughs> yeah, so, I won't do that. I'll be nice. <laughs> yeah, I'll have to, okay. I'd have to rewrite search on the back end. <laughs> no, it's great. No, it's great. Thank you. All right. We'll see y'all back at 730.
All right, throw in one more minute. All right, all right. Okay, so let's finish out the search page. We are going to create a reusable component that is going to handle, oh, let me share the screen. I'm going to create a component that handles both the filtering and the sorting dropdown. So this dropdown and this dropdown are the same component. They're just receiving different props for rendering different things. But at the end of the day, they're still going to do the, they're still, um, they're the same component. We just tell it different things for different functionality. Um, same way product card is reused, right? So all these product cards, they're showing different images and different names, but it's the same component. So <clears throat> we'll start by creating a component there. Now we can close out search input. We're done with that. We want to keep search page.js open because we'll need to import this new component. Um, but now we're going to go and open the search page option JS file. So we're going to build this thing out or start to. Okay, so we already have styles, right? There's already styles that are in here. Um, we can kind of get a hint that we're going to need some text. So um, whatever the label is going to be, and then pretty sure that's the label, and then the select itself. So in H or yeah, in HTML, um, did you guys use select inputs at all, or did do a, a lot of form stuff in HTML? Not really, okay. So we're gonna go over this select input a little bit as it pertains to React. Oh yeah, it took a long time to find those photos. Uh, I had to make sure they were all free that we could reuse them. <clears throat> uh, let's see, so what, first thing we'll do is we'll import our style, so we'll import dot slash search page option dot sets. And then we'll export const search page option. This is definitely gonna take props. 
Defo. And we'll start returning some markup. And like with anything else, we'll give it a class name of the, whatever this is called. And we'll, we'll start there. Now, if we, we have to think about um, when we're styling this thing, let's see. Okay, so each one has a height of 40 pixels. All right, so when we, if we look at this, oops, not that one. That's not the finished one. If we look at this, each one of these is 40 pixels in height. Um, we kind of have to think about how these things are gonna be rendered. So right now on a, on a medium sized screen, they're rendered side by side with this right here. They're rendered side by side here, but you notice the 12 products, it's kind of on a different, right? So right now they're all in line. This is kind of stacked. So we have to think about that. And that's just gonna come down to, oops, taking advantage of some bootstrap classes um, in order to make that happen. So since we already have like the underlying CSS done, uh, we still need to designate some classes to dictate how this is going to work. So this one's kind of like the exception to the others where the, the main div is gonna have more than one class to it. Um, and that's just to accommodate how this thing renders on the screen with um, you know, different columns and things like that. So because these things render like in a row, let me find the... Uh, Because these things render in a row, um, they kind of have to be columns of their own so that we can stack them the way we want to and things like that. So first thing we'll do is on the main div, we'll do a property of dflex. So we're gonna guarantee that it's a flex box inside this particular column, not necessarily the row. Rows are already flex boxes. Uh, but this column is to be a col dash six for mobile. And so on mobile, they're side by side like this. They're each going to take up six of those units. And on desktop, looks like they're threes. So over here, we'll say col dash six for mobile, col dash md dash three for desktop. And inside here, we'll put another div. Last name is search page option, double underscore text. So it looks like this was not the label. This was, oh no, yeah, sorry. Yeah, this is the label. It's, this label here where it says filter by. It's on mobile, it just says filters and you know whatever the short order is. So that's what we're accommodating next. And that is going to be, well on mobile it's display none, right? And then on medium sized screens, it'll be display this flex. And inside here, we're going to have to render a prop. So props.text. So whatever text we pass in, whether it's going to be filter by or sort by, or if you have other options down the road, like you know, rating or something, I don't know, it doesn't really matter. Uh, we, we need to be able to account for the fact that we don't want to hard code this, right? Because we want to reuse this for both the filtering and the sorting. So we pass in a prop. Next thing we're going to do is we're going to use a select element. We'll start by giving it a class name, search page option, double underscore select. Now I'm gonna multi-line this because we'll eventually get there. But search elements take 
a bunch of option elements. So if we were to look at, you don't have to follow along right, right now, just right away. But if I have a select, I would have a bunch of option elements. And each one of these op option elements represents what shows up in the dropdown. That's just basic HTML, right? So we're not doing anything special there. But we have to tell it which options to use for, for each one. So we're going to have to pass that in as props as well. Um, so yeah, so basically the way a select element works is you have your select tag and the only children that should be in there are option tags. And each one of those option tags has a value property, right? That dictates that when that user selects that thing in the dropdown, the value of the select input element becomes whatever that value on that option was, right? So whatever they click, the value gets transferred up to the, um, to the actual select element. So with that in mind, that means our select needs a value. And we're gonna say props.value. And there's a reason for this. So when you have an element that's a form element, um, if you don't give it a, val a prop, a value prop, that value is just gonna stay on, on the element and you can't actually modify that value, right? So you can't, you can't control it, basically. Um, it's whatever the user does. And we wanna have, we wanna be able to control some of these elements so that, you know, if we want to have like a default value go in there, we wanna designate what the value is gonna be to start. So if you have a list of like 25 different items, how do you select which one, right? Um, by default, it's usually, usually the first one, but not always. You might wanna have a different default value. So the way we do that is by designating, we control what value the select element has at all times, no matter what. Now the user still has to make changes in it and the user has to be able to update it somehow. But what ultimately the value itself, we're going to control. So we'll have some control over how that happens. And the way we do that is through the onChange callback, the event handler, and for now, we're just gonna say event goes to some code. And we're just gonna to do this later. We're gonna we're gonna come back to this. But essentially what's gonna happen is whenever the value of the select changes from the, from the user's point of view, when they do something, we're gonna call some sort of function that handles how this value gets updated. And the reason for that is because if you remember on the search page, we need to send three different values to the product search endpoint. Well, if the value only ever exists in this select element, how do we get it up? How do we get it up there, right? We don't wanna do the, um, <clears throat> we don't always wanna do the query selectors. Like that doesn't always make sense. Um, so what we can do instead is just tell it, you know, where to update this piece of state because we'll have to create a new piece of state for the filtering and for the sorting but we want to do this in a reusable way. So we can't really do that in a reusable way with the query selector because there's more than one of these things. So you'd have to write a query selector for each one of those and that gets kind of tedious. Um, now it made sense for the, the search input, right? Because that's part of a form. These aren't really going to be part of a form. Um, we're just going to be updating data that eventually gets sent up to the uh, product search endpoint because there's no submit button on one of these things, right? We want to see changes. If I come over here, you know, there's, there's no submit button next to any of these things, right? If I click on tour, it filters like right away. Like I didn't submit anything. So it's doing it for me, right? We want it to be responsive like that. Like same with best selling price ascending, price descending, right? So we want the user interface to update based on the user's interactions. It doesn't make sense for us to start typing and have it immediately change, right? Because you'd see everything with Ws, then everything with WA, and it's like, that's a lot of network requests. That's like too busy. So we only want that to happen when we actually submit that thing. But with filtering and sorting, we want that to happen right away. There's no tours for water events. Sorry, folks. <laughs> uh, 
So that's a nice user experience. So let's do that. All right, so eventually this will have something in here. Uh, but for now, before we do that, let's actually render one of these things to the screen. Let's get some options in here. Um, we're gonna have to pass in props for that. So for now, we're gonna say props.options. And that's going to eventually be an array of things. But I'm just gonna keep it like this for now. I'm just gonna save that. I just know that I need to pass in text. I need to pass in options. And eventually there'll be one more prop. We'll get to that. But let's just get something. Let's just get uh, this empty select on the screen first. So inside search page, we'll import our search page option from page option. All right, so now I need to see, this is going to be rendered in a row. So we're gonna to have to render that row. So let's get some of this markup out of the way because there's some, some long class names in here. All right, so let's come down to search options right there. This is what we need to replace. So div with the class name, uh, search page. Oops, sorry, search page, double underscore options row. Right, this would be the row that renders our, our different columns. And then I'll say row. Looks like I put some padding in here. So PL dash four. PL dash MD dash zero, PR four and PRMD dash zero. So no padding on the left or right on the desktop, but we want some padding on the left and right on mobile. All right, so here's our row. Now this particular row is gonna handle Sorry, that's not the completed one. This row right here. So we've got some space over here we need to account for. All right, so this will look a little different on mobile. So we need to figure out the spacing for all this next. So we'll create a div. And no special class names. We're just gonna designate um, Kyle dash MD dash one. So on medium sized screens, this will be one. That's this little space off to the left here. And on mobile, we want that to be gone. So D dash none, but we want to make sure that it does still render for. Um, medium sized display. So we need to make sure that we also designate the size at which point it shows back up. It's great that we're designating it at, you know, one column over here, but if it's hidden, you know, there's no way to bring it back until we give it a designation for that. Just more bootstrap. And this is a self-closing div because there's no children inside of here. So we can close that. All right, next thing. Class name equals so next divs. Let's see d dash flex. So I've got d dash md dash none. So this particular one is not going to render on. Oh, I see what I'm doing. Okay, here's this is this is some trickery, and um, you'll see this from time to time. So kind of go along with me here. Align items dash center, so we're centering things vertically. Justify dash content, wow, I can't like. <laughs> uh, dash end, and call dash md dash four. I did a lot of like CSS tweaking to get these to this point. So if we were to take the time and go through these one by one, um, trying to tweak this UI, we'd be, we'd be here all night. Um, 
So we're going to leave that like this. Next, we're going to copy and paste that row. So we're going to have two of these things. <clears throat> I'm sorry. Uh, yes, yes, we will. The second one. So it looks like we've got D flex. Oh, I see. So change D flex to D dash none. So this one's going to hide. So this one is shown on mobile, but hidden on desktop. This one's going to be hidden on mobile, but shown on desktop. So D dash MD dash flex. We can keep the rest the same. So we're, we're, we're flip-flopping and what's being shown and when. Now inside these divs, we wanna to check to see if there are any items present from the result of our API call. So we're gonna do some curly braces to do some evaluation. I'm gonna do some parentheses and I'll show you one little trick here. I'll say items or empty array. So you should have inside the parentheses you should have items, double pipe and an empty array. <clears throat> and I'm going to say dot length. And outside of the curly, I'm gonna say products. Copy that down inside the other one. So it exists in both places. And I'll show you what that does. So we basically have the same thing here and here with just these classes flipped. What that's gonna do for us, is if I look at the finished product on desktop, right? So the top one, well, this, let's see. So this one is, no, this one's mobile. This one's desktop. So on the desktop one, we're showing it as display of flex. Grab this back here. So, which is over here. Now on mobile, this is coming first on mobile, right? So we, we haven't imported the, or we haven't designated these yet, but on, on mobile, it comes first. So if you think about the way rows and and columns work in Bootstrap is you have a row, one column can take up 12 units, right? Any columns that come after that are automatically rendered underneath it. So if you look here, this column is taking up the entire thing. Everything that's rendered after it comes below it. But desktop, it's over here. Well, we can't, using just Bootstrap, I don't think, um, render this after these columns just by changing screen size. So the quickest way to do that is to designate another div that's just hidden on mobile, but shown on desktop, right? So we're kind of just kind of uh, doing some trickery, some UI trickery here. Um, and you can do this with a, with a bunch of different things. I wouldn't overdo this sort of pattern because it can be confusing. And I definitely would not overdo it if this was really complex logic. The only thing this is doing is checking the length of the items array. And if there's no items, it checks the length of an empty array. All right, so inside this parentheses, we're evaluating this value. It's either gonna be the items array or it's gonna be an empty array. But either case, there's a length property it's either gonna be something or it's gonna be zero. And then we'll say either something or zero products in both places. So here, if I were to look for this, right? I don't find it, zero products. In fact, wait, that's our example one, which would still say, yeah. So it still says 12 products. So we're still rendering that somewhere. Um, oh, which is the thing I just created, Never mind. <laughs> yeah, so here we've got 12 products that came back or we've got no products. And the only reason this is working is because we're doing this, right? We're, we're giving it by default, 
an empty array if this is not a truthy value. If I were to take this out, just as an example, I'll refresh the page. Oh, well, that's a problem. Cannot read property length of null. Well, why is that? Well, when the page loads, items is null. There's no property of length on null. So I have to tell it, if this doesn't exist, make something that has a length. That way, by default, it's zero. Does that make sense? I need the length value of whatever the items array is. And if there is no items array, I need to give it something that is an array that I can grab the length off of. Now, I wouldn't want to put anything in here, right? Because there's nothing there by default. So what this logic says, hey, either one of these things is use that value if it's true. So if the first one's true, use it. Or if it's not, use this. That's what that logic says. Mm. Yes, correct. All right, cool. So that's just a little, like I said, some little tricks. So now, between these two, we're going to render our search page option. And for now, we'll just, when we need two of them, we'll render two in the middle. It doesn't have anything in it yet. But if we look at our UI, we see some empty input boxes or empty drop downs. Doesn't do anything, obviously, there's no options yet. But at least we can see that our UI is doing what we want it to. So that's cool. So we can see the products here is on one row, shown on mobile. That row is hidden on desktop, and this one's shown on desktop instead. Cool. Everyone with me so far? Excellent. Okay. So now let's um, let's think about how we can render some options here. So I'm going to do this in the search page.js file and come all the way up to the top. And let's create some default options. Now, these options eventually could come from some endpoint uh, if you wanted to do it that way. So if the backend provided all the options to render, um, we could listen for that. In this case, it's we're just going to hard code them for now. Um, but just so you know, this, this data could come from an endpoint just like anything else. So right underneath our import statements, we'll say const filter options is an array. And we'll say const sort options. It's also an array. These are going to be options that we're going to pass down that will eventually be created into option um, HTML tags. So what we need to pass in, we need to talk about options first. So if we go over to search page option, we're going to be mapping over some stuff. But what if when the, when the page first renders, let's just pretend that this data is coming from the back end. That's going to be null to begin with, right? So we want to provide a default value. So we're going to do the same thing. So around props.options, we'll do some parentheses. And we'll say, or empty object or I'm sorry, empty array, technically an object. Um, we'll dot map off of the parentheses. So whatever gets evaluated in here, if there's props.options, great. Otherwise, it's empty array. Either way, it's going to be an array. We'll map over that. That'll take a callback. Actually, we'll do parentheses to parentheses. So this will be an implicit return. Inside our arguments, we'll accept an option because this is the singular form of the plural options. 
We'll also take an index. And we're going to return an option tag. Now, the first thing we want to do, because we're working with something that's in an array, we give it a key. We'll just use the index. Not a very super complicated. Um, oh, cool. That's awesome. Yeah. I've had a couple of people say they wanted to redo this, their, um, their stuff in React. So that's cool. Yeah. So we want to make sure we pass in an index. Like I said, it's not a very complicated array. We're not working with database objects right now. So an index to render like three options is fine for the keys. Um, option also, the option tag also takes a value. In this case, it's going to be option dot value. I'll explain this in a minute. And the option between the two option tags will do option dot text. The reason each option is an object is because we need where there's two different things associated with that. There's the value itself, and then the text that's displayed to the user. Now you may be thinking, well, why can't I just use the same value for both? Well, let's say that the value is um, self-guided tour, no spaces. So when the user clicks the drop down and sees self-guided tour with no spaces, it just looks off, right? Like, why is there any spaces in there? Well, you could put, okay, well, I'll say um, you could do self space, a self space guided space tour, right? So now there's spaces for both the value and the option. But what if the back end doesn't accept spaces in the value? Like, what if the, the, the thing you're looking for in the database, there are no spaces? Well, now you've got a problem, right? So you can't use one or the other. So you have to use both. So the easiest way to get that in there is by having an array of objects where each object has a key of value and a key of text. That way you have both. Uh, is the option tag an object because of the map parameter? No, the, uh, the option tag is the, the element itself, but the option element inside, I'm sorry, it's, it's the same thing, same word that describes different things. So the option HTML element, is the HTML element. This array of options, each element in the array is an object we're just calling option. We could call this like opt or something, right? If we wanted to not confuse ourselves or confuse ourselves more, depending. Um, just, I usually like to make the array names plural. That way there's a, a singular to iterate over. It's because it's a component. Element. So when you're mapping, um, we're just mapping over an array of things. And we want to return a new one of these option tags for each option in that array. And we're just designating each one's going to have its own value. Each one's going to have its own text. Hopefully, hopefully that helps. All right, so, all right cool. So now we're rendering this stuff. Let's go over here. And we need to actually create these arrays of objects that have both where the objects have a key of value and a key of text. So inside this first array, we'll create an object. We'll say, oops, I'll go back to my notes. Should I get everything right? We'll say the text is filters. Value is an empty string. Yes, correct. That's correct. Those are the, yep, those are the properties off that object you're iterating over. Yep, you got it. All right, so that's the first object. And I'll explain why that's an empty value in just a second. The next object would be text tour, oops, in quotes, tour, the value of tour, lowercase, because that's what the back end is looking for. Those are the options that are, exist within the database. But if you were to see a lowercase tour as an option in a dropdown, you'd think that the person 
writing this stuff up doesn't know proper grammar. Um, at least I would, I'm one of those grammar people. Um, I would rather see a capital T on the option presented to me. But this is one example of why this isn't always the same as this. All right, and we'll do one more. So this will be text, backpacking, the value of all lowercase backpacking. Okay. So we'll basically do the same thing for the sort options. Text is going to be best selling. And the value is going to be best dash selling. If you want to wait until I copy and paste this in instead of typing all this stuff out, you definitely can. That'll save time. So I'm just typing words at this point. Sending. Sending. It's trying to spell it right. Price. Descending. Descending. So let me save this, copy and paste that in here. Let's see, search groups.js after creating options arrays. All right, so if you want to copy and paste that, if you don't feel like typing that stuff out, it's there. All right, so now we have these, these two arrays of options. And while we're at it, let's create a couple more things in here while we're up here. So we want to know what the default value is going to be for each one of these different inputs that are on our search page. So if I say const default, default query, well, we know the default query is an empty string, right? As soon as the page loads, it's going to be empty string const default filter by, we're also going to set that to an empty string. Because when we go to a search page, if it's just an empty search page, we don't really want to filter anything out yet. Right? We want to show everything. And then const default sort by, well, we may actually want to choose a sort by that makes sense for our business. So I would want to sort by default on best selling, right? Because I those are the ones that are the best selling. I want to sell more of those quicker. So if when a user goes to my search page and the first thing they see, they like what they see, well, it's a best seller, which means it's, I'd probably make a really good, decent profit off that too. Like if I notice something selling more than something else, I'm going to adjust my pricing. I'm going to do all kinds of different things to accommodate that, right? So if you have a product that's super, super popular, um, as a business, it would make sense to capitalize on that somehow. So I'm gonna sort by best selling. And that's also gonna help with like word of mouth and stuff like that, right? Like, hey, go check this out. You don't like what they got. First thing you see is, you know, all the high, high ticket items, high traffic items or whatever. Um, cool. So now we have all these default values. We've got some options. We can actually take this right here, this default query, and set it to right here instead of the empty string being in both places. Now this default query value is right here. Again, this could come from a database or something too. Just another pattern. Well, that's cool. So we have something for query. We also have filter by and sort by. So let's create those pieces of state while we're at it, since we're up here. So we'll say filter by, set filter by equals new state. And we'll set it equal to our default filter by value, which is an empty string. 
We do the same thing with sort by, set sort by, new state, default sort by. So I'll leave that up there for a second. So now we have, ooh, let me, yes. So now we have our default filter options, our default filter by value, which we're using in our piece of state here. So by default, that's our first thing that we send off to the query. Or yeah, query. <laughs> we're just calling it query here too. So we're sending it off to the endpoint. We're sending the query, filter by, and sort by. So the first time the page loads, these are the things that will be sent off. Except now I have to finish this out. I see query, query. Well, now I can get rid of the values here. Now, if I click on filter by, I see filter by is being um, used down here and sort by the same thing, right? So I've got the variable, the same name as the key name that is being expected on this endpoint and these parameters. So I'm all good there. But now we have to get all these options down into the uh, into the search page option components, right? We've got to render those options. Everyone with me so far? All we've done is create default values at this point. All right, so let's go down to our first search page option. This one's going to be our filter. Now, remember, we, it takes a prop called text. So text equals filter by. Takes another prop called options. Oops. Those are our filter options that we just created. It takes a value. That's that value that's up in state. That's the filter by variable, right? So set filter by will change this. So we've got that. We could do the same thing for our sort, so let's say text equals sort by, options equals sort options, value equals sort by, variable. Save that, it's gonna format my text here. So we're just passing text options and value props down to each of these. I come over to my screen. Oh, look at this. There's my options. Now you notice the reason, I'll go back up here real quick. Filters has a value of empty. Now if filter by, has a default val value of empty string. So what's gonna happen is whatever, come down here, whatever value I pass in, the first time it renders, that's the value it's gonna search for within those option tags, right? Each one of those option tags has, has a value property on it. So if I look down here, I could say, okay, well, whatever this value property is, and whatever this value is coming in here, Grab that one first. It just so happens that filters, that's a description, right? Um, I'm just using it as a descriptor. I could have it as empty, empty string in both cases, but that's like, what is this thing used for on mobile, right? So this is kind of like another trick that you can do instead of having like a, an empty string as its text and its value, um, which essentially means nothing. Um, you could just put a filter name in there. Um, so that selects this by default. Now this isn't gonna change yet because we haven't told it how it's supposed to change. Um, and best selling, you see it grab best selling first. It just so happens that it's the, <laughs> the first item in the list, uh, but I could come over here. Now you don't have to actually do this. I just wanna do this as a, I can make this the last item in the list. And it's still gonna pick that one first because that's the value that comes in first. So what it does is it matches this value with all the different options 
that are, you know, so this is the option value, the option tag value. And then this value here, whatever that is first, which happens to be best selling, sorry for the jumping around, it's gonna match that value here. It's gonna select it as the first thing. Does that, does that make sense? Whatever value of select is, that's the option that's gonna show. Unless the value of select does not have anything that's in here, it'll display nothing until you actually click the drop down and select something. So if it can't find an option tag that has the same value, it won't display anything. Um, now, in some cases that might be okay, depending on the application. For us, we always wanna show something. I just decided I always wanna show something in here. So that's why I gave filters um, a value of nothing so that at least we'll just select one of those things. All right, so cool. Uh, let's see, where was I? Search options, right. So now that we are rendering these things, yeah, did that make, did that make sense? With the value of select matching the option value? We're, we're just, we're iterating over a bunch of objects and creating option tags for each one. Uh, let's see, so uh, now, when the user actually makes a change, yeah, so you'll probably wanna rewatch this part a couple times. Um, it does get confusing at first, especially when it's, um, especially we haven't seen the select element in action prior to this. Um, it would've helped to see that in HTML. Um, it's, we're doing the same thing that the HTML does, but it's just now we have this React logic wrapping around the iteration here. Um, so when the user, makes a change to this element, we wanna fire this on change. We have access to the events, which means we have access to event.target.value, just like with the input, event.target.value holds the value of the target element, which in this case will be a select. And, but now how do we, how do we change this inside of page, search page JS, right? Because that's where up here, this is the, this is the thing we need to change. All right, so we need to pass down another prop. And the prop we're gonna pass down, I'm just gonna scroll down here so I don't have to jump around when I come back. We're gonna say props.onChange. So we're gonna pass in a prop with the same name as the event handler that we wanna target. And this is common. It makes it easy to know what it's for, right? Because the name will tell you what it's for. But we don't wanna fire it all the time. We only wanna fire it if props.onChange actually is a thing. Otherwise, if we call this, if I say props.onChange and call it as a function, if that's not really a function, like if it's null and it hasn't been defined yet, that's gonna throw a big exception. So we want to check to see if this thing actually exists. So after this, we'll say props that on change and, right? So if it exists, then we're going to do this thing. Then we're actually going to call it. And what are we going to pass in? We're going to pass in event.target.value. So what, what this is doing is saying, if this is truthy, if the user actually defined an on change prop, we're going to call it if it's a function, and inside that function, we're gonna pass the value of whatever the select element is at that particular time when the user actually made the change. So now that we have that, we come back to search page. And we'll start with the search page option for filtering. We'll say on change equals, now you remember this is a function that is being passed the value of the select element. So we're gonna get a parameter, we'll call it value, because it makes sense. Because that's what, what we're getting out of it. And that'll go to the set filter by state updater function. 
and passing the value. So what happens here is on change will get called when the user makes a selection in the dropdown. That on change prop is a function, so it's going to call it. And this is the callback we're going to give the function. So it's expecting a value because that's what e dot event dot target that value is. We're going to get that value and we're going to decide what we want to do with it. In this case, we're going to update the uh, filter by piece of state. Well, that's all well and good. And I can do that here. You can see it is, it is updating it, right? That's cool. It's setting the value and we're passing that value back down in, like we're passing it back down into the component. And that component saying, oh, this is the value I should show in the dropdown. Cool. So it's going to find the, the, the next option that has that value and it's going to display it. So we're, we're controlling every aspect of this component, every aspect of the select element. We are in control of it. That's called a controlled um, element or a controlled component. So if I were not to pass in this value, it may change the value like in search page JS. Um, well, that's not always guaranteed to be the same thing that's being displayed. It's that same thing like we were doing before, right? You want to pass in the value that you want displayed. And I think that was in one of the exercises we were going over where we were doing like the, I think it was the copycat, you're passing in the value. So. <clears throat> yeah, so cool. So every time the person makes or the user makes a change, we're going to call this thing, we're going to pass the value. That's great. We'll get the value here. We're going to set it up here in state. But if you notice, our results aren't changing, right? So what do we have to do now? Well, we got to listen to for any changes in that in our dependency array. The same thing every time the user submits a new query, we're listening for a change in this value. So now we can say, oops, not that, a comma filter by. So every time this filter by value changes, we're going to do a query. We're going to do a query against the database. So now I come over here, tour. Ah, there's my tours. There's my backpacking. And there's everything, right? So every time that thing changes and every time this changes, which only changes when we actually submit the form, then it does the query, right? Because if I were to do it on every single character change, that's just gonna be like products jumping all over the place and maybe it gets bogged down because your endpoint, you've got 50,000 users typing all at the same time. And it's like, oh my gosh, you know, it's like, it's crazy, right? They're all accessing the same endpoint at the same time. That's just way too much network traffic to handle. It makes sense for this because they're not clicking on this 500 times a second. You know what I mean? Unless they're neurotic. <laughs> uh, but at the same point, like this makes more sense from a user endpoint, right? Because, or a user perspective. As soon as I click this, I want to see this filter. Okay. So let's do the same thing for sort by. So we come down here. All we have to do, is we're going to copy this. We're going to paste it here. And we're just going to change from filter to sort. It's doing the same thing. We're just targeting a different updater function, right? I hit save so that it kind of prettify, pretty, pretties, ah, pretties this up. These are essentially the same thing other than the values I'm passing to each prop. The signature of this callback doesn't change between the two outside of the fact that we're using a different updater function. Right? So copy and paste where you can, where it makes sense, just to save yourself some typing. Uh, but we also need to listen for changes on that variable as well. So now if I save this, now I'm seeing the changes in each one of these things. Make sense? 
Uh, I will put this back up top, copy and paste this. So this is basically our, I think this is done. I don't think there's anything else I added to it. No, nope, our search page is complete. So I'll just put completed search page.js in the chat. So if you need to copy and paste that, you've got it. I'll put the completed search page option. This is the base, this is done as well. Completed search page option.js. That way, no, not say that. Okay. That way, if you weren't able to keep up there, um, you can copy and paste those in and you should have a working search page, just like the rest of us. All right, that basically brings us to the end of class. Um, are there any questions on this? Do I need to reiterate on the concepts we went over or the specific JavaScript methods or anything like that? Anything that uh, feels confusing on this? If, if if you're understanding everything so far, what we've done today, give me a thumbs up so I can at least understand who's um, who's got this part down, uh, who may still need a little bit of um, clarification. So I'm seeing thumbs ups, it's awesome. I'm seeing head nods, it's cool, fantastic, 50-50, okay. Anything specific? Okay, yeah, I mean, you still may need to just kind of watch it again and just go through it again. Um, there's a lot there. Uh, like I said, there's a lot to search, right? So all these things affect the search endpoint and the results that you're getting back. It's not just, oh, um, video. Oh, okay, gotcha. Yeah, just keep, keep working on it, right? Um, there's not just typing into a, an input box. That's not the only thing that search is, right? Search is filtering, search is sorting, search is anything else related to parameters that are going to this endpoint that result in something coming back that's different from what you saw before, right? Um, hopefully different. <laughs> Otherwise, there's not a lot of uh, not a lot of uh, diversity in your products. Um, but maybe that's okay. I don't know. But why have search if they're all the results are the same anyway? Okay, let's see. Okay. Search for might be filter options, right? Yep. Yeah. Yep, just expanding the amount of things that you can search for or things that you can filter on, right? So for example, um, like on the Raymore Flanagan website, you can filter by price, you can filter by the fabric. The type of fabric you can filter by, like if you're looking at sofas, the configurations, like there's all different types of properties of these products on whatever search thing it's for. Like if you go to um, like, if, uh, like an e-commerce site for selling video games, right? There's genres, right? There's um, different systems that those games are targeting. Like there's all different types of things that you could create. You can have all these different, um, all these different drop downs for each one of them, right? So maybe for some of these, like for price, maybe it's a sliding element where you can slide between, you know, your, your minute and max values. There's all different types of things that go into search. It's not just, like I said, it's not just this or this or this, it's a combination of all these things. And then your, your endpoint needs to be able to handle all those things properly. Search is a, a big deal in e-commerce because it's, it basically is e-commerce. You can't have proper e-commerce without good search. Otherwise, you'll never find what you're, uh, what you're looking for. One other question about the search. So um, yeah. when you're putting a word in the search bar, it's not searching for the attribute. It's, it's searching the descriptions or like yeah, so when you set up a search, what does the, okay. when you, the user gets to create the word that they put in? <laughs> yeah, so <laughs> my implementation of search is really simplistic. Um, a proper search wouldn't be as like 
really simple as mine is. So when I type water, oops, that's not a tour, hold on. If I type water, it's searching the description and the name for that text, right? Um, if I were to type, and I was um, talking with Carolyn on this, so waterfall retreat, right? We'll bring back only this because it finds this text. But if I were to say water and retreat, nothing will come back because there's no exact text that says that. It's not, it's not differentiating between the two, right? So a proper search would come back with, you know, everything that has both, right? Uh, there's more logic built into it. Mine just is really, really simple, just for demonstration purposes, right? Um, so I can give you a quick little glimpse. So inside the test data, here's all the data, right? So waterfall retreat, enjoy a retreat full of waterfalls. Um, it's very redundant. <laughs> and then it has this description here, which is a bunch of like gobbledygook. It's just this Lauren Ibsen stuff. But essentially what the, what the back end is doing, if I go over to the test API and I look for product search, here it's saying, I'm gonna return, um, if you guys go over regexes, regular expressions at all, sort of a little bit. So this is doing a regular expression match on the name and the description. So as long as that text exactly matches something in one of these two, then it'll return it as part of the result set. It's super simple. I mean, it's really simple. If I were to get more complex with it, um, you know, I would add in things like, okay, look for all these search terms, right? And make sure they're in both the name and or the description instead of just one or the other. Does that make sense though? Like it's, it's, it's how much logic you want to dump into the, the search engine on the back of it, on the back end. Uh, let's switch to the site or network better. I'll kind of just went over that, right? So you've got different options to search for, different filters, um, developers that have spent more time developing the algorithm on the back end. Um, add jQuery. No, not really jQuery. Uh, this is where you want to tie in um, your API endpoints, whatever services they are tied into, whatever back end services. Those are the services that are doing all the, the number crunching, so to speak, all the text searching, all those different things, all the algorithms. Um, that's going to be on the back end. And they'll touch the database, but they'll do it. And yeah, you could do that as, as like a SQL statement that could be part of the logic for sure, right? Because that's what SQL is, right? Or like, you know, or SQLite or Postgres SQL. Um, you write queries against the database. So the backend service would construct necessary queries based on the user input and run, create those queries in you know, whatever SQL language you're using, and then run those against the database, get the result set, send it back to the front end. And that all happens like, like that in a lot of cases. Sometimes depending on the search, how many database results it has to go through, the quality of this query that you've written on the back end, right? So there's ways to optimize queries. There's ways to optimize your database, which you'll get into um, called indexing. So if you index the database, it runs a lot faster because it knows what to look for instead of just brute forcing its way through the whole thing. Um, yeah, so you'll get into more of that on the, the database end and the back end uh, on the next module as well. I'm um, pretty sure Max will start touching on both of those things. Yeah, it, it's very simplistic. Um, it's an it's what I would classify as a NoSQL database type structure. There's no part, there's no tables or rows. It's just um, documents that have specific properties on them. Very similar to MongoDB which is a, a NoSQL database. You define the schema um, at runtime almost, right? So not really runtime, but you, you define the schema. You could define the schema on the front end and then pass it back to the back end rather than everything being predetermined ahead of time. So there's, there's a lot of flexibility in both of them, right? 
So the the flex the nice thing about a structured um, like SQL type database is that it can be extremely fast, extremely fast, and hold lots and lots and lots of data, tons of data. Um, but the nice thing about things like Mongo with the NoSQL database, you can be more flexible with the documents that are in it. They don't all have to conform to whatever tables and rows you set up ahead of time. You can designate almost on the fly what documents are going to be stored and what properties they have. Now, you want to be consistent, um, but there's more flexibility. You can add properties later without having to touch any of the other previously entered uh, records in the database. Um, you can, and then you can kind of backfill those properties at your leisure. Um, so there's, yeah, it's very, it's very dynamic. It's kind of like JavaScript in a database server. Very similar. Uh, any other questions? Search can be, uh, we could go on for hours <laughs> uh, with search, but this is like, as complex as this might seem right now, this is like just scratching the surface. This is a very, very basic search. All right, so if there's no other questions, uh, we'll wrap it up for tonight. Don't forget about your 30 second surveys. Tomorrow we're going to, well, we're gonna look at your, uh, uh, your project so far. And then depending how much time we have, how, does, how long does that usually go for? Or it just kind of depends on the presentations. You guys typically devote like at least an hour, about 40, 40 minutes? I feel like it's about that, yeah. Okay. Yeah, so we'll have plenty of time to start working on the cart page. At least get some markup going. Uh, we'll see how far we get with that. We may have to finish the card page on Wednesday. Um, and then we'll have, we should have enough time to, um, well, we can finish the footer as well, which is really simple component for just rendering some, some markup at the bottom of the page. Uh, um, yeah, so cool. So we'll go over the card page tomorrow after your projects and then we'll see where we're at. And then at the end of the week, uh, we'll start um, I can post the survey. Yeah, know. yeah, yep. <laughs> we'll start talking about building this for deployment at the end of the week as well. In case you wanted to do that. All right, so stop sharing here. And all right, so I guess I will see you all tomorrow and uh, have a great night. And just as for homeworks, just keep working towards your homework that's uh, due by the end of the week. You should be able to complete uh, most, if not all of it by now, as far as like the concept that, that we've gone over. All right, everyone, have a great night. We'll see you tomorrow. Hi, Joey. <laughs>